Thank you, Alan. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Last week, we were talking a lot about open-mindedness. One of the three essentials for recovery is open-mindedness. So we were looking at that. The last paragraph we read last week was on the bottom of page 51, and it says, we asked ourselves this. Are not some of us just as biased and unreasonable about the realm of the spirit as were the ancients about the realm of the material? Even in the present century, American newspapers were afraid to print an account of the Wright brothers' first successful flight at Kitty Hawk. Had not all efforts at flight failed before? Did not Professor Langley's flying machine go to the bottom of the Potomac River? Was it not true that the best mathematical minds had proved man could never fly? Had not people said God had reserved this privilege to the birds? Well, only 30 years later, the conquest of the air was almost an old story and plane travel was in full swing. So those people easily got rid of the old idea that we couldn't fly. They got over it because they saw that we could in fact fly. And so that was a new idea that had taken over the old idea. And since then, we've had to do this a million times. We had a lot of things that were in our lives that we counted on and depended on and used every day that we had to cast off to one side and bring on a new idea, a new technology, a new item. Like our cell phones. We used to have phones that were connected to the wall by a cord. We hung the phone on the wall, had a long cord, and we could walk around the kitchen with talking on the phone. That would be ridiculous today. We all have cell phones and we threw away that phone on the wall with the long curly cord for a little thing that slips into your pocket. And not only that, that little thing that slips in our pocket is a veritable computer. You have a clock on there, you have a, you know, you have a timer thing on there, you have everything on there. You don't need all these other devices that we used to use. We don't need those devices anymore. Very few people wear wristwatches. Very few people carry around calculators. You got one on your cell phone. Television sets, they used to be big, bulky, heavy things. And then they became flat TVs. And now they're these little, light, skinny things, not even an inch thick. We can carry them around, move them from one room to another, plug them in, and it's a full-grain TV. We can, And it's not just network TVs. We can watch anything we want use apps to stream stuff that we could never do before. That's a brand new idea in the last decade. And we're using it every day, all of us. So it's a new idea that we've had to cast away many other old ideas to get rid of that. Tonight we start on page 52, the first paragraph. But in most fields, our generation has witnessed complete liberation of our thinking. Show a longshoreman a Sunday supplement describing the proposal to explore the moon by a means of a rocket, and he will say, I bet they do it, maybe not so long either. Is not our age characterized by the ease with which we discard old ideas for new, by the complete readiness with which we throw away a theory or gadget which does not work for something new which does. So we readily do that. There's no problem with, with picking up new ideas. So we're open-minded about a lot of things. But when we get to the spiritual side of things, we're not so open-minded about God or about the spiritual world or about spiritual principles or about living with this as part of our lives. We're not so open to that, especially not agnostics and atheists. They struggle with this when they come into AA. So we're going to talk a little bit more about why we have to get rid of these old ideas for the new ones, because it's critically important for our moving forward. 
So the next paragraph is actually a paragraph which describes the opposite of the ninth step promises. We read the ninth step promises every night in, in the rooms and we hear it over and over again. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development and then all the promises that come with at the end of the ninth step, we read about that constantly. But here's what we felt like and the things that we lived and believed before we came into AA. We had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and desperation. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Was not a basic solution to these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. So these are really important things. We need to, to get over this feeling of uselessness, misery, depression, the lack of being able to make a living and get a job and keep a job. All these things were problems that we had when we were drinking because drinking would keep us away from our work. Drinking would make us feel funny. And so we had to change things. We had to give up old ideas for new ideas. And we need to do that at this point in our lives with giving up on our belief system that kept us drunk and kept us downtrodden all our lives for a new idea that there is a God personal to you, a God that can help you out, a God get, that can guide you through your recovery and onward. So it continues, when we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance upon a spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. The Wright brothers' almost childish faith that they could build a machine which would fly was the mainspring of their accomplishment. Without that, nothing could have happened. We agnostics and atheists were sticking to the idea that self-sufficiency would solve our problems. When others showed us that God's sufficiency worked with them, we began to feel like those who had insisted the rights would never fly. So if you come into AA and you hang out a little bit and you have these ideas that self-sufficiency, doing it yourself, is good enough, stick around a little bit and you'll see the miracles that are happening in other people's lives in, in AA that had them open their mind and change their thinking in several different ways. And we're going to learn some of those things. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about logic. We all love logic. Logic is great stuff. We liked it. We still like it. It is not by chance that we were given the power to reason, to examine the evidence of our senses, and to draw conclusions. That is one of man's magnificent attributes. We agnostically incline would not feel satisfied with a proposal that does not lend itself to reasonable approach and interpretation. Hence, we are at pains to tell why we think our present faith is reasonable, why we think it more sane and logical to believe than not to believe, why we say our former thinking was soft and mushy when we threw up our hands in doubt and said, we don't know. So when faced with this decision, is it logic, is it self-sufficiency, or might it be a spiritual power, a power greater than ourselves that can guide us? They just said, I don't know. And they gave up. But what changed their minds? This next paragraph is incredibly important. It's the description of a bottom. It's a description of that place that we don't want to be, but invariably alcoholics must hit this bottom in order to move forward. The paragraph says, page 53, second full paragraph, 
when we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis we could not postpone or evade, we had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? Quite a dilemma, that choice, that hard choice of is there or is there not a God? Is he or isn't he? But when you're crushed by a self-imposed crisis, that of being a desperate, beat up, drunk, with no way of getting out of the hole, we're totally at our bottom, we're desperate, we're weak, we're scared, we're angry, we're self-pitying. When we're crushed by that self-imposed crisis, we can't postpone it anymore. We're at the end of the rope. It's now or never. If we continue drinking, we don't change our mind and change our approach, we will die. It is the end. And we can't evade it. We can't get around it. We can't take a different route. We're there. We're at that point of making that decision. And we have to make the decision at this moment when we're at our bottom. It says, arriving, arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with a question of faith. We couldn't duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason toward the desire shore of faith. The outlines and the promise of new land had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands had reached out in welcome. We were grateful that reason had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. Perhaps we had been leaning too heavily on reason that last mile, and we did not like to lose our support. So here's a new idea. People are reaching for it. They're moving towards faith as opposed to reason. Helping hands are reaching out to them, and yet they hesitate because they really believe in reason and they don't have faith. And it goes on. That was natural. But let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? For did we not believe in our own reasoning? Did we not have confidence in our ability to think? What was this but a sort of faith? Yes, we had been faithful, abjectly faithful to the God of reason. So in one way or another, we discovered that faith had been involved all the time. So we always had some faith. Do you ever fly in an airplane? When you get on that airplane and you sit down and you're ready for your flight, don't you have faith in the pilot, the ground crew, that they're going to that the plane is worthy of flight and you're going to make it to your destination alive or else you'd never fly. If you didn't have faith in that pilot or whatever pilot's up there, you would never get on an airplane. We found, too, that we had been worshipers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. Had we not variously worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves, and then... With a better motive, had we not worshipfully held the sunset, the sea, or a flower? Who of us had not loved something or somebody? How much did these feelings, these loves, these worships have to do with pure reason? Little or nothing, we saw at last. Were not these things the tissue out of which our lives were constructed? Did not these feelings, after all, determine the course of our existence? It was impossible to say that we had no capacity for faith or love or worship. In one form or another, we had been living by faith and little else. We just didn't recognize it. So, what about a life without faith? What would that be like? Well, it says, imagine life without faith were nothing left but pure reason, it wouldn't be life. But we believed in life, of course we did. 
we could not prove life in the sense that we can prove a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, yet there it was. Could we still say the whole thing was nothing but a mass of electrons created out of nothing, meaning nothing, whirling to a destiny of nothingness? Of course we couldn't. The electrons themselves seem to be more intelligent than that, at least so say the chemists. Hence, we saw that reason isn't everything. Neither is reason, as most of us use it, entirely dependable, though it emanate from our best minds. What about people who prove that man could never fly? So they prove that man can never fly, but then men flew. So their proof was nothing. So pure knowledge, pure reasoning didn't work. It didn't help because it got proved to be wrong. So our reasoning didn't go far at all, didn't go far enough. And then it goes on to say, yet we had been seeing another kind of flight, a spiritual liberation from this world. People who rose above their problems, they said God made these things possible and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual release, but like to tell others it wasn't true. But see, when you come into AA, it's kind of hard when you're sitting in a whole room of people that are sober, it's pretty hard to deny that there's a God, that there's faith, that there's a power greater than ourselves. And the book's gonna tell us why right now. Second paragraph, page 55. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other it is there. For faith and a power greater than ourselves and the miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as men himself. And that's true. If you look back through history, there are people of faith that just believed everything would work out, and sure enough, it worked out. They were sure they could overcome issues, and sure enough, they did. They overcame all the issues that they were facing. So, faith has always been there, and it's deep inside of us. There's some things we know are wrong just because we know they're wrong. No one told us. We weren't instructed. We didn't read anything about it. We just know what's right and wrong. And if we stay with what we think is right or wrong, we have a happier life. When we go against what we know is right and wrong, we suffer for it from guilt and remorse for doing things that are not honest. We suffer for it. And why do we suffer for it if there's no power greater than ourselves. If there's not real faith in humankind and we're not exhibiting faith in anything, then what's the problem? Why, why do we feel bad about it? You know, a kid goes into a grocery store and wants to steal a little candy bar. He's not, he doesn't know all there is to know about stealing and not stealing and the ramifications of stealing. But when he picks up that candy bar, he looks both ways. He looks around and makes sure nobody's looking at him. Then he stuffs it in his pocket if he can get away with it. Why does he look around if he doesn't? He already knows that that's wrong. Then it says, we finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. So most of the reasons that people couldn't find a power greater than themselves is they were looking in the wrong place. They were going places where the real God doesn't exist. The real God exists within you, inside of you. You know, that's where God's 
is inside of us. And that devil of thought in our head that keeps us looking outside for God never looks inside. So with that idea, we know where God is. Now we have to find him. And it's not easy for agnostics and atheists to find this power, to finally give in and get this power. It takes some time. And in the next paragraph, it says, we can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. If you search diligently inside yourself, you will find a power greater than yourself. He goes on to say, In this book you will read the experience of a man who thought he was an atheist. His story is so interesting that some of it should be told now. His change of heart was dramatic, convincing, and moving. So we're going to get to hear how somebody who had no faith, who didn't believe, who thought reason was enough, and was staunchly uh, agnostic as he could possibly be, and we're going to hear about his turnaround. So on top of page 56, our friend was a minister's son. He attended church school where he became rebellious at what he thought an overdose of religious education. For years thereafter, he was dogged by trouble and frustration, business failure, insanity, fatal illness, suicide. These calamities in his immediate family embittered and depressed him. Post-war disillusionment, ever more serious alcoholism, impending mental and physical collapse brought him to a point of self-destruction. One night, when confined in a hospital, he was approached by an alcoholic who had known a spiritual experience. Our friend's gorge rose as he bitterly cried out, If there is a God, he certainly hasn't done anything for me. But later, alone in his room, he asked himself this question, Is it possible that all the religious people I have known are wrong? While pondering this, the answer, he felt as though he lived in hell. Then, like a thunderbolt, a great thought came. It crowded out all else. Who are you to say there is no God? This man recounts that he tumbled out of bed to his knees. In a few seconds, he was overwhelmed by a convic conviction of the presence of God. It poured over and through him with the certainty and majest majesty of a great tide at flood. The barriers he had built through the years were swept away. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. He had stepped from the bridge to shore. For the first time, he lived in conscious companionship with his creator. Thus, our friend's cornerstone was fixed in place. No later vicissitude has shaken it. His alcoholic problem was taken away. That very night, years ago, it, was, it disappeared. Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought of drink has never returned. And at such times, a great revulsion has risen up in him. Seemingly, he could not drink even if he would. God had restored his sanity. That man is Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson completely rejected the God idea in his third visit to the town's hospital in New York. One night, after talking to Abby Thatcher, he woke up and had a great white light spiritual experience that altered his life forever. And there's many accounts of people having such experiences. Uh, they happen 
pretty often, actually. For Bill, it was the thing that changed his life forever. He was on his deathbed. They thought he was going to die soon. But from that moment on, never had another drink, got well, and managed to take us through our recovery journey by writing the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and numerous other things that he's written that has given us the wisdom to get sober and stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. And then it goes on to say for the end of the chapter, what is this but a miracle of healing? Yet its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing to believe. He humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he knew. Even so has God restored us all to our right minds. To this man, the revolution was sudden. Some of us grow into it more slowly. But he has come to all who have honestly sought him. When we drew near to him, he disclosed himself to us. So that's the miracle of going from not believing to believing. And it's a slow process for some. It's a faster process for others. We just take it one day at a time, one step at a time, and develop this relationship with a power greater than ourselves and see what the miracles are that it can provide. You know, and if you, you know, if you're sitting in this room and you're th sober for 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, 60 days, then God has already acted in your life. You were never able to quit before you came here. You come here and you were able to quit. What is that but a miracle? God has removed the obsession to drink. That's the first thing he does for us is to take away that obsession to drink that keeps us drunk and not functioning in the world the way we should. And you walk into AA and in a short period of time, the obsession is lifted. What a beautiful gift, something you've never been able to do your entire life for yourself. So we'll continue next week with how it works and we'll actually learn everything about this program, how this program works, what the steps are and how to work the steps. So we'll start How It Works next week. Thank you all for listening. It's been my pleasure. See you next week. Back to you, Alan.